first and foremost, I would like to thank Dr. Norman for allowing us to use his classrooms. But today we have a very special guest, all the way from Cambridge, UK. So we've got Dr. Neil Stott, who is the co-director of the Cambridge Center for Social Innovation. And he's also the director of the Masters in Social Innovation program at the University of Cambridge's Judge Business School. And we have the Center for Social Innovation. So he was the chief executive of Keystone Development Trust for 13 years. And Keystone is one of the largest development trusts in the, in the country. So in the UK, um, Keystone Trust did a very significant role as it relates to community development, social enterprises, property development. So um, Dr. Stutt, he transitioned from Keystone to Cambridge, and he's playing a big role in developing some of the world's leading social innovators and social entrepreneurs. So I was very ecstatic to find out that he was willing to come to Clayton State and talk to you, our wonderful students. So make sure you have lots of questions, and I expect you to learn from his lecture today. So without further ado, Dr. Neil Stott. Uh, thank you. Uh, the first thing, obviously, my accent may not be, you know, familiar. So if you, if I say something uh, you don't understand, please feel free to to stop me. Okay. Um, it's a great honor to be with you. Um, it's nice to see faculty as well as students in the room. I've also brought, brought my, my own fan club. Um, Rich is one of my students um, on my master's program. Um, we're going to teach the US Air Force next week, so that's why I'm here. And uh, Jimmy Childry, he's a local Georgian chap who is one of my uh, practice fellows. I know Jimmy for years. We did our master's together uh, back in the day. Um, so I am a practitioner who has moved into academia. So at Cambridge, we have faculty and management practice. So it means we've been out in the real world, and then we become academics. So we add something different to the mix uh, than some of our, our colleagues who've been academics since they've been in short trousers or, or, or PJs, pajamas. So this is my career in logos. You may not get the logos, but basically there's a lot of charities in there. So I work for children's charities. I work with uh, prisoners, ex-prisoners, who often didn't remain ex in my care. Unfortunately, many went back to prison. That's the nature of the beast. Um, work with children with disabilities before working in uh, local government or the city, as you'd call it, mainly doing things like community development, crime, investigating racial harassment, promoting race equality, you name it, I did it. And then 13 years as uh, chief exec. That's the sort of stuff I've done, if anyone's interested. A bizarre mix from CCTV to publishing to housing. So I've had a very, very wide, wide career. I've enjoyed nearly every minute of it, which is good. And most of my work, has been focused on uh, places in the UK which are poor and amongst groups who are either disenfranchised, who are disengaged, who do not have opportunity for some reason. That's what I've been doing. So I work in Cambridge. Anyone been to Cambridge? Not you, you don't count. Anyone been to Cambridge? Anyone been to England? That's a good start. So Cambridge is a small city, a uh, very old city. It's the second oldest university in the UK, but 860 years old. So some of those buildings are really, really old. This one here is, is one of the first colleges. And I think that is definitely about 860 years old. It's a very beautiful city, and a lot of people come to it. Um, the problem is, though, there's still a lot of deprivation and poverty. It is the most unequal city in the UK as of three months ago. Rich, poor. Not necessarily on US standards, I have to say, but still, still pretty bad in places. And I work in this building. This is the Judge Business School, which is a very famous building. So if any of you ever come to Cambridge, 
you must make sure that you let me know and uh, you can come and see me and I'll show you around. Someone you may recognise, this gentleman here, this is uh, Leon in class, so Leon is one of my uh, fellows, research fellows, who comes, we have people come every year into class with our students to give a broader perspective. And here's Leon teaching about black management history and social enterprise, which the students loved. So, what I do is social innovation. Has anyone heard the term social innovation before? This is not a test, don't be shy. Social innovation, show of hands if you heard of it. There's uh, some tentative, there's a maybe, okay. Social enterprise, who's heard of social enterprise? Well, good, so, yeah. So social innovation, this gentleman was the first director of the Stanford Center for Social Innovation. He now works at the Apple University. He defined social innovation in this way. It's all about novel solutions to social problems which are more effective, efficient, etc. <coughs> lots of people like this. Lots of people like this. This gentleman, who's a professor at Oxford University, um, he says social innovation, start off with the idea of a social problem. Okay? However, what I think of a social problem, what you think of a social problem, what you think of a social problem may be very, very different. Social problems are constructed depending on where you are in the world, what's going on. So he gives an example of, of homelessness in Canada, which was constructed as an idea very differently than, than homelessness in other places. Secondly, social innovation and social innovators tend to focus on novelty, new ideas to, to solve these, these problems, which is fine, but as you'll see later on, we also have to pay attention to history. Hello. And social innovation is about organising for scale. So it's not enough necessarily to tackle the small things or small things. You have to try and scale projects bigger and bigger. This is our definitions, which are slightly different. Social innovation is the development of creative and practical solutions to complex social problems. And the most important thing here is social change organisations. They're organisations and there can be lots of different types. If you're in the UK or the US at the moment and you're trying to tackle social problems, you may use in American a not-for-profit, in English a charity. You'll probably use a social enterprise, like this gentleman here, and they're seen as the only game in town. But they're not. If you're going to tackle problems, there are many different ways to set up solutions. It could be an NGO, could be a social enterprise, could be a not-for-profit or a charity. There's many different ways of doing it, which I'll touch on later. But the big question is why now? Social innovation as an idea has swept the world. I've taught in Vietnam, Hong Kong, in the, in the US and other places, and everyone wants to hear about social innovation. It's hot, it's trendy, and lots of people, particularly students, want to get engaged with it. So the question is, why now? Why do students like yourselves want to get involved in social innovation? Any ideas? Why is it so important now? Is that an idea? I mean, just to improve the world in general. Okay. I mean, because we are Okay, to improve the world. Yes? Good answer. Any others? Yes? Uh, with, with increased access to information, we see how bad certain things really are, whereas normally we didn't understand what situations were, but now we can actually see different rates and social things that are unjust and we want to get involved because we now understand. Okay, is that because of technology? Yeah, okay, so we can see more. Any more, any more ideas? Faculty, do feel free if you've got any ideas as well to, to chip in. Okay, so here's my answers. Number one, 
the financial crash of 2008. Most of you are probably you know, too young to remember this, but the implications were huge. All of a sudden, the, the way the world operated, in, t in terms of how money was managed and how people looked after your money, fell apart. And all of a sudden, people began to criticise capitalism, a particular form of capitalism that really did not care a lot for, for people. Now, I have to be careful here. I once gave a lecture to a group of Americans and I was accused of being a communist. <laughs> I am not a communist. You know? I'm critical of things like capitalism, but it's made me a communist. So basically, people started to criticise that capitalism was not working for the majority of people. For some, it was working extremely well. OSHA brought it, but we've got, I, I teach a video uh, about America, about what people think is a distribution of wealth in America, uh, what they'd like it to be, and what it actually is, and I can tell you, it is extreme, extreme, the, the differentiation of wealth. So that was very important. Secondly, as this gentleman said, there's nowhere to hide. No matter where you are in the world, including in some of the less desirable places to live, um, you know, some of the states that monitor their people very carefully, you will get found out more quicker than ever before. Fear. Fear is a great motivator. I had a student who worked for a big uh, company in the US. They said nothing focuses the mind more than watching your colleagues go to prison for bad behaviour. So many companies are getting into social innovation because they want to be seen to be virtuous. Whether they are virtuous is debatable, but at least they want to be seen to be virtuous. Hope, you know, to make the world a better place. In our context, in the UK in particular, austerity, which means cuts to public services, cuts to welfare services, services that you don't necessarily have here, but in England and UK, they feel it when those services disappear. And lastly, a generational shift. Something has happened. Is there any MBA students in the room? MBA students? Okay. Well, in the past, when I first taught at Cambridge, when I spoke to MBAs, they were polite to me, and that was as far as it goes. Okay? They weren't that interested in what I was teaching. Um, now I have 35, 40 MBA students in my class when I teach this stuff. People have realised that, you know, that change needs to be made and as a generation of younger people they want to be at the forefront of that change even if they're going to work in their big companies. So even if they're going to work in companies around here, Amazon's here, uh, what's the other big one, UPS, whatever it may be, People are wanting to make change within organisations. People do not want to work for organisations that do not share their values. People do not want to work for organisations that are doing bad things in the world, whatever it may be. So something has happened. And these are sort of things, and lastly, wicked problems. Anyone, any clue what a wicked problem is? Have a guess. So we don't know what a problem is, why is it wicked? And it's not a good thing. I'll tell you. So a wicked problem is something that is big. It's, it's global. It is contested. So let's take climate change. You know, until relatively recently, most people, a lot of people, agreed that climate change is a thing. You know, it, it is going to impact on people. Certain presidents and others have, have uh, disputed that of late. So it's contested. But all these problems will not just impact us now, it will impact your children, your children's children, onwards. So they're intergenerational, they're complex, they're challenging, they're wicked. So, possibly amongst all those, one of the most frightening is this one here about food and food supply, how much food we have to produce in the next 40 years for a global population. And the problem with all these, they're often interrelated, and if you can be really gloomy about it, 
as I will be next week with the US Air Force, all of those are conflict multipliers. So if bad things happen, water rises, migration, resource scarcity, it, conflict emerges. And, in my opinion, it will not just be in Bangladesh or Myanmar or places that you just see on the news. It'll be here. It'll be here. Scarcity breeds conflict. Water. Water in the US is a contested and scarce resource. Um, you know, there's all sorts of things that could trigger issues. If we believe climate change and we see rising temperature, rising waters. So, one could be very gloomy. We're doomed, okay? Great book. This is by Iraq uh, war veteran. It's a great book. We're doomed, what now? And that's where social innovation comes in. So I run the Center for Social Innovation, uh, and we do three things. Um, unofficial is think, teach, do, okay? So we research, which I'll come on to later. We teach, talk about the masters, and I teach MBA students. But we also do. We feel it's really important that it's not enough just to write stuff, teach stuff. We have to actively engage with the people, our students, the communities that we're involved in. So we run an incubator called Cambridge Social Ventures, which again I'll touch upon later where we've taken 800 people, about 170 organizations, through incubation to create social enterprises. That's part of us doing. So, when we talk about social innovation, uh, a colleague and I came up with uh, uh, three things that we, we teach and we think are important for the future generations, and now. The first many of you are familiar with, social enterprise. So it's creating new organizations to tackle a problem. It could be something that's happened to you, your family. It could be something you're passionate about. It could be lots of different things. Often uh, it's about people are sick of their jobs and they want to try something new and exciting. So social enterprise, social entrepreneurship, which is making change within organizations, which I'll come back to. And one we made up, which I quite like though, social entrepreneurship, which we'll come back to. If you're interested, there's an essay. It's not, too hard, it's not too hard to read, hopefully, an essay on this topic. So social enterprise is about growing new businesses, for profit or not for profit. In America, you use the term not for profits, okay? Uh, and I'm sure you're all familiar with them. I dislike that term immensely because having run a not-for-profit, if you say I'm from a not-for-profit, people think you're inefficient, you're not business-like, you're just being nice to people, you have no idea to run a business. I use the term not-for-private profit because the profit goes back into the organisation. And social enterprises aim to be sustainable and create social and economic value. So it's not just about making money, it's about making money to sustain activity. They're committed to making social impact, that's really important. And their value, missions and governance align. I don't know about the US, but in the UK, sometimes if you put the word social in front of something or charity after something, people assume that you're virtuous. And I've worked for some terrible organisations who are social organisations. You have to make sure that your values, your mission, how you treat people, how you organize the, the, the activities are done well. That's social enterprise. I think most people understand that. It's a go-to solution. We have a social entrepreneur, a local social entrepreneur in the room that some of you may have met. Paint. Taking old paint, mixing it, and selling it. Is that correct? Yes. In a nutshell. That's a great solution to, and you sell it to people who need it. It's a very simple solution to a problem. And do you make money? Well. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. So anyone who's been an entrepreneur or is considering being an entrepreneur knows it is not the easiest of route. You know, being an entrepreneur is hard. 
being a social entrepreneur is harder because you have to be nice to people as well. You know, nice to people, nice to the planet, and make a profit. That's really hard. I struggled for 13 years doing that. I'm not being nice to people, am I, Richard? A <laughs> couple of examples from our incubator. So this is one of my, one of my favorites. This is uh, prison voicemail. It's a very simple solution. The problem is, if you are in prison, you tend to lose contact, at least in the UK, with your friends, family, and your children, if you have children. This is a means for you to record messages and vice versa, so you can read a story to your children, record it, and they can pick it up. The clients, the people who pay for it, are the family, not the prisoner. It's secure, and it's in every prison now in the UK, because people see it as a really important way of keeping prisoners connected with their families. Really simple. Four years hard work to get it going. Harry Spectres. So Harry Spectres is a chocolate company. It makes beautiful chocolates, quite expensive chocolates, but it was set up to employ that young man who is the founder's uh, son, who is autistic and couldn't find work, but what he was good at is certain tasks. And he had a friend who was good at numbers, put them together, created a business which is now blossoming. <clears throat> the important thing here, obviously, is employing people with autism, give them an opportunity, but it's having a product you can actually sell. Some people buy the chocolate because they know the story. So they, input, they feel it's important to buy into it. Other people don't care about the story, they just buy the chocolate because it's really good. Either way, they're making a profit and doing good. Another example at a different scale. So this is a consultancy that works with artisanal miners, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa, but also now in Mongolia and the Philippines, to get a better deal. Okay, that's number one, to get a better deal for their labour. But number two is to make sure that the, the blood minerals, the blood diamonds, that are a result of human trafficking, slavery, or maltreatment of people in many countries, doesn't happen. So they're all very different social enterprises. As you can see, it's a quite useful tool if you want to make change. And also cooperatives. And cooperatives are big in America, but these are some examples from the UK. A cooperative is a special sort of legal form where it, most people in it own it in some shape or form. I particularly like cooperatives. So we, are we clear on social enterprise? We all know. Anyone thinking about working for or setting up a social enterprise? Apart from you? Yes. Tell me. I mean, after what you've been telling us, it's coming into my mind I should apply to social enterprise. It's not the easiest thing to do, but it's a really interesting thing to do. Yes? And your colleagues, your faculty here, some including Leon and others, I'm sure will advise you uh, and how to do it. It is a good solution in many contexts. Um, one of my favorites, is, so I worked, I ran a development trust. In American, a development trust is a CDC, a Community Development Corporation. The first CDCs were set up in, in uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant in New York and they created housing, economic and social value in some of the poorest places in the US. There's still many of them around. Great organizations. So, oops, wrong way. So social entrepreneurship. So we're getting a little bit more challenging here. We're on newer ground. So social entrepreneurship is about making change within organizations, tackling social challenges. Why is this important? Well, the reason why we set up our centre is because we're a great fan of social enterprises, but it's not the only solution, because most social enterprises are small, if not micro-organisations, and if you want to tackle those big issues like climate change, 
you need a lot of social enterprises to be able to do that. So if you want to tackle the big issues, you have to involve the corporates and you have to involve the public <laughs> sector as well. So here we're talking about corporate and big public, how to make change in those organisations. Now the Dean of the Business School is here in the room, so I want to, can you put your fingers in your ears for a while? Okay, making change in organisations is hard because vested interests, power, history all get in the way, okay? So what we teach is, is how to make change without losing your job. If you're a young person, you're going into an entry level job or you're a middle level job in a company, how can you protect your values, make change, encourage the organisation to do things better? It's not easy. But the good news is, a lot of organisations are doing this because they want to keep you. They understand that this generation of young people want this stuff and if they are not seen to do it, you will not stay, you will move to a different organisation. They're very worried about their, their, their workforce. So that's why it's important. So an entrepreneur is someone within a corporation who makes uh, change. It used to be used about setting up new projects or setting up new business areas. And the difference is entrepreneurs focus on the new, while the entrepreneurs are trying to make a new reality on the inside. Okay? They're trying to make change. So this young woman, Barbara, she works for Unilever. I'm sure most of you know Unilever, massive company. Many of the products you use, you know, hair, toothpaste, whatever it may be, Unilever make, or that. Um, she worked with Unilever to um, set up a project in uh, Africa and beyond to get water. She mobilized the resource of Unilever. She mobilized their supply chains and their their will to create micro business opportunities across Africa around potable water, which people needed. That's one example. But the other examples where people are making change, are to change policy, behaviours within the organisation. So one of my students, um, Tim, um, he runs the uh, Circle of Entrepreneurs and he works for Barclays Bank in London and he, he is head of entrepreneur, social entrepreneurship. So his job is to encourage people like you to do this stuff. So any of you going into, this, into corporates and you're interested, check out the circle of entrepreneurs. It was called Young Entrepreneurs, but now he's over 30, so he decided it should be entrepreneurs. They have chapters across the US. I can't remember if they've got a chapter in Atlanta or not. Can you Google it for me? Good man. Um, worth getting involved with. You meet line-minded people, people support each other, motivate people together. It's worth doing. So this is the biggest challenge we face. How to make a difference within corporates. I'm sure most of you have heard of um, corporate social responsibility. Do you teach CSR? I presume you do here. I'm sure you do. Okay. Many people including myself, some think that a lot of CSR activity is greenwashing and social washing. Okay? Volkswagen, as a company, won all the awards globally for its CSR activities, and then the, the, um, the emissions crisis, when they had been fixing their cars, broke. So on one hand, they're doing this nice stuff. On the other hand, they're doing this bad stuff. That can't happen. I know supply chain management is one of the key things that happens in this business school, and many of you go into supply chains. Supply chains are really important for social innovation. Big companies and their supply chains, which reach across the world, when you get down to some of the lower levels of supply chain, are often involved in places with people you shouldn't be involved with, where the bad things happen. So the biggest thing that many companies can do is to get their supply chain more ethical, cleaner, greener, and not abuse people, in my opinion. That's where the real revolution with a small r will come in corporate social innovation, in supply chains. Okay? So a friend of mine works for uh, Mars cat uh, pet food division, and she was telling me 
that they don't know what happens when they get down to the fifth, sixth level in their supply chain. On the boats, you know, in the South China Sea, around the Philippines, catching the tuna or whatever it is, they have no idea about the conditions of their workers. You know, they do know that people are on the boat for three years, it's a form of modern slavery, but not doing a great deal about it yet. That's really important stuff. Okay, social entrepreneurship. So we're moving up a level. So this is about people coming together. It's about people from the public sector, the social sector, and the corporate sector working together to tackle the big problems. Okay? Now, if you read any of the literature on this, cross-sector work, partnership work, whatever, it all says this is the way to go. We must do this. We must learn how to do this. Unfortunately, we are terrible. We are terrible at this. Organisations are terrible at working with others nicely. They're not very bad at playing well together. But coming back to my point earlier, if you want to tackle climate change or any of those big issues, it cannot be the corporates alone, it cannot be the public sector, it cannot be the social, it has to be a combination. So it requires a new way of working, a new discipline, a new way of thinking about things, and a new generation that, that can step between these different sectors, are comfortable working with business people, comfortable working with the public sector, and comfortable working in a corporate setting. That's quite a challenge, but that's, that's going to be some of the best jobs of the future are going to be in this sort of work, in my opinion. So it's about creating platforms for change. This is our own. So every logo on there is a social enterprise that we have assisted, uh, we have helped come to fruition, we have birth, if you like. And as you can see, they range from cycling, technology in Africa. This one here, Repositive, is, is big data. It's DNA data for cancer research. Um, it could, monthlies was, uh, was about uh, sanitary products, affordable sanitary products. Power to Aspire was uh, about getting um, disabled people with disabilities, sport, and um, Ama Ella was actually high fashion lingerie, but from ethical sources. So it's a complete bizarre mix, but these are all projects that we have helped set up. So Cambridge Social Venture Ventures is a social entrepreneur. He's providing a platform for other people to do stuff. Another one is fair trade. I don't know if any of you are familiar with fair trade. You know, when you buy your coffee, sometimes it says fair trade at the bottom. Fair trade was a, is a very important movement that started in 1946 to get quality products to people like you, but making sure the people who produce the stuff, be it in Mexico, Africa, or wherever, were treated fairly and got reasonable money for their efforts. And why fair trade is important in this is because if you think about the supply chain from farmer to supermarkets, these people have had to work for 40 years to create these equitable, fair supply chains. It's quite an amazing achievement to do that. Even though some people criticise it, I think it's an amazing achievement. And that's what we need in the future, this sort of activity. Another one is also about the power. So climate activists and others have been saying coal is bad. Okay, they've been talking for years, coal is bad. Some people listen, some people have not listened. But then US and UK insurers have suddenly said, no, we are not going to insure coal-fired stations anymore. That's a huge thing. So power rests in the strangest of places. Who would have thought insurers would have that level of power? They could stop an industry in its tracks because it's uninsurable. So that's an example of where social entrepreneurship has been successful over time. 
Social innovation is not new. Even though some of you have not heard of it, it's been around for a very long time. People just think it's new. This is a book we found in the library at Cambridge, um, 1858, Social Innovators and Their Schemes. This is really quite a passive aggressive title. This author did not like social innovation. He said it was socialists. The term first came out after the French Revolution, uh, again about the social problems. I will stop soon, but I just want to talk about the long view. Because many of the people I teach who are, call themselves social entrepreneurs or social innovators think it is new. They're the first generation who invented it, but it's not. Here's an example. 1498, the shore porters, the people who took stuff from the boats onto the land. 1498, Scotland set up a cooperative because they're being exploited. The weavers in Fenwick in Scotland. This was African Americans who set up uh, in, uh, in Cheapskate. They set up their own uh, landing and dock because they had been exploited. Uh, and so they decided to set up their own place of work, and, um, which was very successful for a period of time. Cooperatives. I like this. You can't read it. It's very Victorian. Progress, okay, said the boat. But what it says on that thing there, it says, the good of all, the duty of each. Okay? The good of all, the duty of each. Now, why that's important? Because with respect to myself, some social entrepreneurs are single purpose. It's about them sometimes, their organization, their vision. These sort of organizations was about the collective, the, the duty. We all have a duty to help, to help each other. Another example. So, in imagine, I'm sure many have seen programs, but imagine 19th century London. Imagine Dickens. Imagine the smog, the dirt, the filth. Imagine 12, 13, 14 year old girls, and it was girls, making matches. Okay? And they're making matches using red phosphorus. And red phosphorus is very dangerous. So if you're making matches, you're touching yourself, touching whatever. And these girls used to get, used to get terrible diseases in their faces. It's called fossy jaw. I won't be too graphic, but basically it was not good, and many died. Lots of campaigns to stop this, but the company wouldn't. So the Salvation Army, which is a church-based organization, decided to set up its own social enterprise, they didn't call it that, created its own factory to make matches from a different product, also 25% higher wages, they didn't sweat the workers, better conditions. Great example of making social change in that context. Another one, local to us. So back in the day, if you had tuberculosis or TB, if you had a bit of money, not everybody could afford this, people were sent away for three or four months to the seaside or somewhere in the countryside. And this, in this hospital, you'd live in one of these huts or maybe on a ward. You're isolated, okay, and, until you got better. Three months. Can you imagine being isolated for three months? Very boring. So what they did at Packworth is they set up social enterprises to create work for people. They created the most beautiful um, products. This is making furniture. Um, Luggage. This is in the 1920s. In the 30s and 40s, 50s, they made uh, bits of cars, wood panelling on cars, at a huge scale. All examples of past ways of making change. The reason why I talk about history, and I know Leon's very interested in history, is we can learn a lot. We can learn, for, you know, from history that you know in this area. There were a lot of cooperatives aimed at, you know, from the sort of 1890s onwards, aimed at improving the economic and social opportunity of African Americans. It was a go-to solution for those communities to create wealth and opportunity. It's stuff that happened then we can learn from going forward, in my opinion. So why did this stuff happen? 
Well, often because of crisis, market failure. So I bet you can think of neighbourhoods where you, know, you can't buy anything, you can't buy fresh fruits, the, the private sector is virtually abandoned it, market failure. And this is where the community development corporations first started in the US. If you're interested in stuff, I would Google these. These are great organisations. Public sector failure, so when the, the local state doesn't help, causes problems. But more often than not, people want to take control. People are fed up of oppression, lack of opportunity. They want to take control, bottom up, of their own futures. I didn't know this until fairly recently, but the, the Black Power Movement, um, you know, everyone thinks of their political acts, but actually Black Power had an economic arm, and community development corporations were part of it. They were, you know, very good business people. Community development corporations that came out of that era, uh, this is from 2015, these are the figures. How many there are, how many jobs they create, how much space they rent. These are big organisations. These are great organisations. They're creating wealth and opportunity for neighbourhoods, because they're neighbourhood based. That's the sort of organisation I work for. So, just to conclude, we've talked a bit about what we do, we've talked a bit about why we do it. This is the sort of research that we have the privilege of doing. And I think that research is important because A, it creates new knowledge. B, it creates good examples of how people make change. And C, hopefully, it empowers people to do stuff. And all my students have to write dissertations, and Richard's doing his at the moment, on black history. All, all my students have to write dissertations to create new knowledge, which we promote. So any of you want to come and do a master's at Cambridge, you talk to Richard or me, and we can tell you all about it. So this is one project which is completed. is about child marriage in Indonesia and how NGOs work to try and stop it. This project is about how to create new ventures, essential enterprise in hostile environments. This is Egypt. If you're disabled in Egypt, you tend to be hidden. It is, it is not something that is, you know, it's not a public thing. People are ashamed. So this guy had to work really, really hard to create a business in that environment. Okay, so it's about how to make change in hostile environments. This is another one in Indonesia. This is where NGOs and local people clash. So an NGO comes in and says, we know business. We know what you need to do to be better business people. These people have been honey farmers in the forests. They've been doing this for thousands of years. Big clash between two ways of thinking. But the end of the project was that you know, the team managed to get the two sides to understand each other better, to create better outcomes for all. Bizarrely, we're working on gender and the mafia. Um, we're going to work on a paper on uh, how women's involvement in the mafia and against the mafia are playing out in Sardinia. We're also working on anti-mafia cooperatives outside Naples. We're working in Newfoundland, of all places. If you think it's cold today, go to Newfoundland. It's really cold. So we're working with this little organisation called Fishing for Success, which is about teaching young people uh, the cultural roots, you know, how to hand fish, how to, how to how to produce goods out of fish. Fish are a big thing in Newfoundland, cod in particular. And another project in Scotland, just near Glasgow, is looking at how people, these two women, bizarrely both called Teresa, how they're trying to regenerate this place that's been crushed by steel mill, gone, coal mines, gone, poverty, drug taking, all the other stuff you don't want how they managed to rebuild that community from virtually nothing. So this is a range of things that we have the privilege to work on um, in the centre. So hopefully, I've done a couple of things. One, I've interested you in ideas of social innovation. 
and what it can be useful for in your own contexts, and hopefully too, motivated you to talk to your colleagues, your faculty, etc., about what you can do and what this university can do to create a culture of social innovation so that you, as students and future generation students, can work on the sort of issues that your colleagues are, are increasingly around the world. If I've done that, I've done a, uh, hopefully done a good hour's work. So, thank you again for inviting me. I will now obviously take as many questions within the time limits. Okay? Yes. Uh -oh. Are you another finance person? Uh, actually, I work at this uh, university here. My name is Ronald Yes. I have this conversation many times with my professor, uh, Dr. Priya, about entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship. And as we discussed that, most of the thinking goes back to what economic model, just as Dr. Sior mentioned, what economic model can pretty much capture the very essence of social entrepreneurship? And the reason why the question comes up because if you see economic practice of capital, it was predicated on some kind of social fairness. And then they're moving towards some sort of capitalism. So as you look at the trend going forward, it seems like, again, just like Dr. Sierra was mentioned, it will be more profit driven and less social interest. So the question that comes up is what within all the range of market structure, oligopoly, uh, monopoly, perfect competition, all those uh, models, which one is possible to capture that very idea, which is beautiful to see and describe? OK, so number one, there's no one size fits all. OK, so I started off saying social problems are constructed and contextual. So what works in one place does not necessarily work in another place unless it's imposed you know, upon them. Um, I wouldn't, yes, so that's the first thing. The second thing is there are no, no easy answers. I used to have a slide saying there are no easy answers. This is complex stuff. It brings a lot of emotions to play, particularly in the American context for a number of reasons. This, if I give this talk in Europe, or UK and the rest of the world, I, I tend to get an easier ride from the economists. When it, in America, it's a tougher, tougher sell. Um, but here you, you have strong tradition of this, which is often hit, hidden. I mean, Leon's work is exposing some of the strong traditions of cooperation, of organization, particularly in the African -American, American community, but not just the African American community. They're trying to create different ways of being, different ways of creating an economy that is fair and just, okay? Which is not dictatorial or a communist state. Yeah? So there's no one size fits all. I wouldn't even pretend that. You have to create your own solutions in your own context. I mean, without being too brutal, you drive around Atlanta, you know, you see it in the face, don't you? You see the disparities of wealth and, and opportunity starkly in front of you. I often wonder how, in, the, in one of the most modern countries in the world, how is it acceptable to have that level of difference of wealth and opportunity? I, I, you know, in my opinion, it is not acceptable. It's, you know, here, people think it is to a certain degree. You know, different ways, different ways of looking at the world. Many Americans think our National Health Service is pure socialism. I think it's the greatest thing that's invented. I can walk into hospital tomorrow, get treated for free, I paid my taxes, without worrying about health insurance, cost, etc. I'm not giving that up easily. But different contexts. Jimmy, did you? My sharing experience. You may, Jimmy. Um, I live here in Georgia. My family has auto dealerships in central Georgia. I reluctantly became a board member of my nonprofit hospital in Central Georgia, where I live. Had no interest in serving on the board. It was simply my time to serve. I was doing an MBA at Duke University, 
I was thinking only about for-profit businesses and real entrepreneurship as I thought of it. But when I became a board member, I then became a more reluctant chairman of the board after the chair and vice chair resigned in a board meeting and walked out of the room. When I became chairman and started looking at the hospital, I realized two things. First of all, it's the most challenging business model I've ever experienced, a rural nonprofit hospital in the U.S. Secondly, I've never seen a business with a more important social mission. And without our hospital, many people in our community don't have alternatives. Nonprofit, community-owned hospital, in a very challenging and business environment. That was my moment where I thought we must try to figure this out. And there were no easy answers. That is when I discovered the University of Cambridge Social Entrepreneurship Program where Neil and I were colleagues and classmates. Ever since then, I've thought about social entrepreneurship. It doesn't have to be for-profit or non-profit. It has to be the motivation to try to figure out a challenging or wicked problem and what can be done about it. So it's not one size fits all, it's not for everybody, and it doesn't fit in neat little collars. So that was my experience. That was my epiphany, my aha moment. And it was 20 years ago and I'm still working on it. Thank you, Jimmy. Any questions for any students? Yes. I just want to say that coming from someone from my generation, I think I'm probably speaking for a lot of people that this is a really refreshing idea to see as compared to what we you know, as our parents do and grandparents and that sort of thing. I think that this is something that's going to be welcome. Well, I, hope so. I mean, your dean is at the back and he's listening to you. Yeah. <laughs> and he's got, he, he said to me he's a supporter. Okay. I think you handled yeah. these challenging questions really well, too. Your answers to them were. Thank you. I don't mind challenge. <laughs> Can't count, but I don't mind challenge. <laughs> any, any more quick, quick questions? Thank you. Yes. Uh, earlier, you uh, were talking about how you worked with ex at some yeah. point. Were you trying to reintegrate them into yes. workforce? Understanding that there was a likelihood that some people would end up back in prison due yes. to whatever led them to the first time, how did you like understand? Like, did you have a certain amount of people that you understood beforehand were going to end up going back to the workforce, and how many you weren't? And how did you understand or? Uh, predict your failure rate. Well, I, don't, I mean, I was young and naive at that point. So, uh, uh, I mean, I'm sure it's the same here, but I mean, when, when you've been in, in prison for a certain amount of time, one can become institutionalized, and staying out is as hard. In our context, you know, if it's winter, and winter is the worst. So it's winter, you're out, you haven't got much, very good accommodation, you don't have a lot of money, you know, <coughs> sometimes prison is warmer and safer. Um, there's a lot of things that are driving people back. So what we were trying to do is work with people who were institutionalized to try and help them think differently. But in particular, working with younger people, the first time offenders, to try and get them into other opportunities to keep them away from offending, okay? Our state is not quite as draconian as yours in terms of punishing people. You know, you have more people in prison in this country than most countries put together, frankly. You know, which cannot be a good thing. I have no easy answers for that, partly because I was 23 at the time, and uh, you used to outwit me all the time. I know one thing, never make a video. So we had these young lads, basically, and they were all car thieves. So they wanted to make a video about to teach others not to steal cars. So we've set up this video. We forgot to tell the police we were doing it. <laughs> you can imagine what happened next. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. I better stop. Yeah. One quick question. Is it, I think it's late. It's two here. I, I will be staying for a while afterwards, so I can ask ask other questions. Do you have a question? I'll, I'll wait for after. Yes. Um, one of the things I always thought about, um, especially with social innovation, is just like you said about the healthcare center is how do you try to rally people to not think so much about themselves? Like, because I feel like, you know, going on as future generations, we're becoming more and more almost self-centered and egotism, thinking about our own needs. How, how, how have you been able to really reach to people to be like, hey, you know, sometimes you have to think outside of yourself? Because that's one of my things that I think about with social innovation, like being one of the hardest things is trying to 
tell people that this is not just about you, this is just about, you know, also about the greater good of people. I don't think you tell. You have to create opportunities where people learn. Mm -hmm. Okay? So what it needs is people like yourself who've got the motivations and want to do this. And you have to find ways to bring people in and along. To use our colleague's term, you have to incentivize them in some sort of way. In my opinion, as a community worker of many years, you always start where people are with what worries them the most. Okay? Now, without being crude, in the context I worked in, it was always dog shit in the parks. <laughs> you crack that problem, they're convinced you move on to something else. Even though dog stuff in the parks was not the most important issue, you know, child poverty, you know, domestic violence, etc. was, you can't start with that. You start with what matters to them and you build relationships. I think a really important thing is coming out of some research I'm doing is how hard this is. You know, that you're always having to build relationships all the time. You cannot take it for granted that Joe Bloggs, Josephine, whatever, is on board. You know, just because it's solved one issue, you have to, you know, it's a mobile, it's a tough job. It's a great job, but it's a tough job. And Richard is worth talking to. So Richard is also a, a social entrepreneur. Uh, runs a charity in the east end of London, trying to get disenfranchised black British people into work. You know, so you know he's another guy to talk to. Well, and Jimmy will be staying around for, for a while as well. Yes, but if you think that we or any of us have got all the answers, think again. You create your own answers in your own communities in your own time. That's what's important. I don't know about you all, this was great, this was wonderful, I'm sure you all learned a lot. Well, on behalf of Clayton State University College of Business, we'd like to present Dr. Stott with a small token of our appreciation. Thank you.